Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to welcome everyone to Howard University's Department of Art Artist se um, Talk Series. Uh, this is something new that we're having for the department, and I am pleased to welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Elka Stevens. I'm an associate professor in the, doc in the Department of Art. And I have the pleasure today of speaking with Dr. Mary Ahmed, who is going to share um, a, some insight to her works of art that are in the show, our 50th annual art faculty exhibition. Dr. Ahmed. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. So I guess I'll start by telling you a, a little bit about the, uh, the pieces that I have in the show. There are four pieces, and um, the first one is a graphic design piece that I did for a client. It's a, it's a wedding invitation. Um, so what was interesting about this piece was that the bride and groom are multicultural. The, uh, the bride is a uh, westernized West Indian, <laughs> and the groom is um, what is half Korean, half Chinese. And so the couple wanted something, an invitation that would be very unique but also contemporary to reflect their modernist, uh, modern, their, their modern uh, perspective, but also they wanted to honor the, the older aspects of the, the Asian traditional culture. And so the bride chose a very contemporary color scheme, green and orange, which are very atypical for wedding invitations. But um, I integrated this aspect of the fan to, uh, be, to tie into the Asian culture and then I think my favorite part of working on this project was doing the typography because we used, we translated almost all of the text for the invitations and the wedding programs and all of the other signage for the wedding into Korean. And so the cover of the wedding invitation has their names in Korean. And um, I think because I'm, I'm very interested in typography, that was, that's one of my first passions. Um, the, my favorite part of the working on this project was finding the character set that would support both the, the, the Western Latin characters as well as the Korean characters. Um, I, had a, I had a few experiences working with different languages before I worked on a project with Japanese and I taught in the Middle East and I can read Arabic and so working on the Korean, work with Korean in this invitation was fun. Um, so just, just finding a type, a type face that supported all of the characters that, so that all of the typography within throughout the suite of, of, in, of the invitation would be cohesive and con consistent and that was cool. <laughs> so that was that piece. I think it turned out really well. Um, the bride, when she first saw the opening of the fan, she, I, I knew from the, from her facial expression that I had, I had a winner after all of the, the options that I had presented to her. When she saw me open, open the fan out on, on the video that I sent her, that was, that was when I knew <laughs> this was it. She was quite excited about it. Um, there are three other pieces in the show. And this one here is the visual identity for a conference of the art department was scheduled to host in April, but because of COVID, we had to reschedule it to September. So it's now gonna be a virtual conference in September, September 18th. And the title of the conference is the Urban Transformation Symposium. So I designed the visual identity, the graphic mark for the conference, all of the signage, the posters, the advertising, the postcards. And then we also mounted a community art installation within the hallway of the, the, the art department on the second floor of Childers Hall on Howard's campus. So everything about this, um, this, this design project tied into the theme of the conference, which is challenging gentrification within DC. So the title of the conference is From Go, From Go, Go Chocolate City to Uber Latte Enclaves. And this conference is actually being hosted by Professor Carmichael, who is the coordinator of interior design. And it's a collaboration with Professor Ture, who is at the who is at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, and so they're bringing this conference to DC and to Howard, and there are going to be panels that feature uh, DC councilmen, small business owners, academics, 
community residents, and basically uh, the point of all, each of the panels throughout the, the one-day conference is to address the issues that are uh, that are that that are leading towards gentrification and figure out ways to solve these issues. And so the identity for the conference, the UTS4 with the Urban Transformation Symposium was supposed to visually be a metaphor for the, uh, the incoming larger, more affluent businesses which are coming in to replace the smaller businesses and the, the larger businesses are represented by the larger letters at the forefront of the, the, the graphic mark and then the smaller wording represents the larger businesses being pushed to the back. And then there's a, a visual representation of a, a minimal, a minimized a min, a, and a reduced crane in that line that finds uh, a motif throughout the rest of the, the graphic work. So we did posters, postcards, stickers for the, the, the community arts installation. And um, it was a lot of fun doing the community arts installation because what we did was we covered up a key piece of artwork that is in the Department of Arts hallway that was painted by David Catlett, David Mora Catlett back in the 70s. And so the whole purpose of covering up that artwork was to make a statement about the displacement and relocation that happens when gentrification occurs, the displacement of culture. And so we covered it up with these blank canvases and we invited the community to participate by visually expressing their response to the theme of the conference. And so that's with the photo that you're seeing at the top right. It's a photo of the wall, the David Catlett Mora painting in the background with the blank canvases on the top. And there were posters that uh, were put up around that were designed within the, the, the designed to be cohesive within the brand that I had uh, designed for the conference. And so this conference is coming up in September, in the fall. I uh, hope to see everybody there virtually. Um, do you want to move on to the next piece or did you have questions about this piece? <laughs> We can move on to the next piece. Okay. So this, this next piece that I have in the faculty show is more of an experiment. It's an acrylic painting. And one of the things that, that I have always integrated into my research and my artwork is the social impact mission. Um, throughout all of the pieces that you see that I have in the exhibition, for this show, uh, you'll see the, the theme of um, representation and inclusion. And so I travel a lot. I have, um, every, everywhere I go, I, I try to visit a beach and I collect sand from the beaches. And so this piece includes, well, there's acrylic painting in the background, but there, there are strips of sand from various beaches. And this particular piece features, features only sand from Caribbean beaches. There are 12 Caribbean beaches represented here. And the, the whole point or the goal of this experiment, it's a whole series that I'm, I've started doing recently, but um, the goal was to show the different sands from all the different beaches juxtaposed next to one another so that the differences in color and texture and grain and, and which, which beaches are powdery white sand and which beaches are very corally and rocky so, so that the viewer can see the differences between all the different sands of all the different beaches that I've been to and start to appreciate the diversity because um, there is a, sort of a reflection of, of what we're living through in society. There's, a, there's a, a perception that the only nice beaches, the only good beaches are the ones that have blue-green water and white sand or pink sand. And that's simply not true because I... Um, I have a very deep appreciation for the brown sand beaches and the brown water beaches because I grew up in Trinidad in the Caribbean and we do have beautiful blue green um, beaches there but we also have beautiful brown beaches there and I love them because they tend to be the most untouched, the most preserved, the most natural places and so they're, they deserve as much attention and as much love as the blue green white sand beaches. And so this, uh, through this series, which I'm calling Sandology, I'm trying to represent all of the different sands 
in all of their beauty and juxtapose them next to one another so that people can compare the texture and the grain and the colors. And so that's, um, that's, this is just the beginning of this series. I plan to do a lot more than this. So this is one of the first pieces in this series. And then I have one final piece in the exhibition, which again is also tied into the whole inclusion mission within my, my research agenda and my scholarship. Uh, the first piece, the wedding invitation, of course, was multicultural because of, of all the different cultures that it Im 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 embedded into the design. The second piece, the Urban Transformation Symposium Conference, was built for a conference that's dealing with gentrification. And then this final piece is looking at grid structures that have dominated graphic design, well, since forever. So basically everything we see in the world, every single, every single piece of graphic design, every single piece of advertising, layouts, magazine publication, it's all based on a Swiss grid system. The Swiss modernist grid system, which grew out of the Bauhaus movement, but that grid system pretty much dominates all of graphic design and it is a Eurocentric grid system. It's a Eurocentric style of working, a style of layout. And so in all of the research that I was doing looking into grids, I started wondering, well, when the grid system took over, which grid systems got eliminated from our vernacular? And so I started looking into doing research into all of the, the textbooks and the books that are written about grid systems, and most of them deal with the Swiss grid system. But at the back of the textbook, there would be a, a final chapter that deals with other grid systems, and that's, that's literally the label that they call these other systems. They're, they're other. And so these other systems are not legitimized, they're not validated, and so I started to work in this style and I started exploring what I'm calling anatomical grids and that's that's a very important part of my research in, in giving this system a name because nobody has before and so being nameless is being unrecognized and so by calling it anatomical grids i am trying to justify and validate and popularize exploring other mechanisms other systems of layout and so the objective behind or the the, the method behind the anatomical grid is to take a composition any kind of composition, whether it's a photo, like the one that I'm using here, this is a photo of my nieces and my nephew just playing in a, a water feature park thing, a river thing. And they're just happy and running and, and laughing and falling over and getting wet and just enjoying themselves. But you could take any composition from a, a, a this, this, this photo was shot by my sister on her cell phone and it of course doesn't require, doesn't include any kind of professional composition standards of photography, but you could take an architectural building, you could take um, typography letter forms, you could take a professionally com composed photograph, you can take any composition and create an anatomical grid based on the shape or the form of the subject matter. And so I'm not sure if, if we can zoom in on the top of that piece, but there are, I showed the grid structure how it came about. So the first, um, this, the first image is the first image on the top left is the original photo. The second image is showing the uh, the main veins of the grid system that are based upon the directions of my nieces and my nephews' legs and arms and their torsos. So I just drew grid lines, and you can sort of see see them in pink grid lines that follow their limbs. And then I simplified the grid system because there was just too much going on to make a layout out of it. So the third photo is, shows the, the, the main arteries of the, the grid system. And then I created this layout based on those, those uh, grid lines. And the end result is this poster, which I call Overstand. And the, um, the subject matter of this poster is, of course, inclusion, designing for good, designing, designing what matters. And it ties, in, the, the whole point of this grid system is that I'm, I'm arguing that it is a more meaningful grid system. It's not a disassociated grid system because you can take any grid system, you can take any, any design work and lay it out according to the Swiss grid, but what does the Swiss grid have to do with the, the meaning of the subject? So in the same way that you need to choose typefaces and color systems that 
tie into the meaning of your work, you should also be choosing a grid system that ties to the meaning of your work. And so the anatomical grid system is a way to anchor your composition to something that's meaningful, something that's contextual and representative of the subject matter. So this poster is based on a grid that was derived from the people who are most important to me. And the poster is talking about designing for the future. And so the, 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 the grid system of the composition ties into the subject matter in that way. And so that's how I created this particular art. We're gonna have a whole series of anatomical grid designs that I presented at TypeCon last year. And this is just one of them. One of my favorites because it has my nieces and nephew in it. And so that's, um, that's uh, a, an overview of the, the work that I have put into this show. As, as I said before, a lot of my work, all of my work essentially is part of the fight for inclusion and justice. And I think that's uh, pretty timely right now because of what's going on in the world right now. The protests and the violence. And that's unfortunate. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for sharing a little bit more about your work. Um, I did have some questions, but throughout your presentation, you asked, you answered, actually answered those. I was going to ask you about some key themes, essential themes within your work. And you talked about um, multicultural design. You talked about um, inclusion and diversity. Um, you talked about otherness. Uh, you talked about um, these very important topics um, that are very timely um, throughout. Um, one other question I did have dealt or deals with your influences. Um, what do you think has most influenced the work, um, particularly the work of, on diversity and the multiculturality and gentrification and um, otherness and inclusion? That's, um, thank you for that question, Dr. Stevens. Um, I would say because of who I am, because of where I was raised, because of the culture that I'm from, I have always been interested in inclusion and diversity, except that back then we didn't call it inclusion and diversity. It was just being a Trini. Um, I'm Indian or of, of East Indian descent, but nobody really knows what, what race that is. I don't think there's a definition for what race I am. So when I, when I fill out those forms at the DMV and stuff, I'm, I'm always other. I've okay. always been other. Or just not even, I don't even have a category. If, if there's no other option, then there's nothing for me. So the, the most recent census um, category, the, the, the 2020 census, there's, there was no category for me. I had to put other. Still, in 2020, we still have people identifying as other. That's crazy. Basically, my whole upbringing has been very, very diverse, very inclusive, and that has always been my goal. I'm, I, I've always traveled, I've always wanted to travel, not because I love the beach, but because I want to see the actual cultures, the actual languages. I want to experience non-Western culture and, and, and value systems and, and geographic buildings and architecture and, and, and food and, and language and everything. And so, that was that that's been my whole life but then coming to howard as a student and working at howard and then teaching at howard has has really impacted my activism um i i'm not sure i would have deliberately done this kind of work if i wasn't working at howard and so being in the department of arts at howard university at an hbcu the premier hbcu in the country has had a real um influence in encouraging me and particularly you dr stevens as part of the the junior faculty summer academy that you encouraged me to participate in and have supported me throughout um that 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 academy that summer academy really uh pushed me towards scholarship in this area and so all of my research and all of the articles that i'm submitting to journals they are they are based on this topic they're so they, they surround this this theme that is prevalent throughout my, my experience. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to um, 
share the Summer Academy and, those, and try to encourage um, all of our faculty to be a part of that, if you faculty to be a part of that. Um, you have been very diligent in your efforts and had great success. Um, and the Summer Academy um, leadership is very pleased to have been able to have played a role in that. Um, but your research agenda um, is definitely a strong one and one that is very timely and one that um, is being presented through writing as well as your creative works. One last question for you. Um, in terms of the design work that you're doing and even now in your Sandology um, series, can you tell us a little bit about your process? You understand the themes, you understand some inspiration, but can you just speak just very briefly about your process? You've already talked about the role of typology um, and how important it is to find things that have a multicultural dimension. But let's just give us a little bit of insight. So uh, I will be flat out and say that I'm not a painter. Uh, my painting skills are minimal. I am primarily a graphic designer. And so this is an experiment and my my methodology or my technique, my process is very experimental. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm not a painter, but I'm working with acrylics because I enjoy the medium, particularly the, 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 the aspect of the medium that, allow, that is very forgiving. If you, if you paint something in acrylic that you don't like, you can easily paint over it, which I do all the time. And so I, I, um, I, I think in this piece, you can start to see that uh, my graphic nature is starting to show up in my paintings. Previously, when I painted in acrylics, I would try to paint beaches and sands and oceans, and they were, I love them, but I don't think that they were uh, of a professional standard in terms of fine art or painting. And so I've, uh, I've um, what's the word I'm looking for? Graduated, moved towards this style of, of acrylic in, in which I'm, it, including a lot more graphic elements, more design elements. So you can see the horizontals and the very strong line structures. And, and then I'm, I'm playing with the, the textures of the sand, which is the whole point of this particular piece, just to show off the sand, show off the different sands. And so the process with this piece was, I, I just put acrylics in the background just to form the background. I was very deliberate about the colors because I didn't want, usually when I paint my blue green, my blue green beaches, they are blue green and these beautiful beachy, typical beachy colors. But for this piece, I, I knew I wanted to go in a different direction. So I painted in metallics and browns and golds and, and warm, warm colors that are not typically associated with the typical cliche blue green ocean. And so I painted the background colors in, in this particular color scheme and then overlaid with Elmer's white glue lines, just poured them straight out of the bottle and then just blowed sand onto it. I poured sand out of my bottles directly onto the glue and let it dry and that's really it. I don't, I don't have a, a sophisticated technique or process. I'm more sophisticated in my graphic design work than I am in, in my painting experiments, but I, I, I like the outcome. And this is just the beginning, as I said, of the series. So I'm hoping that it will develop into something a lot more robust and a lot more interesting compositionally. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you for sharing your work. It's been a pleasure listening to you today and thank you for answering our questions. And I believe that we have a question, a scavenger hunt question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Stevens. So we are doing a scavenger hunt in connection to the two exhibitions that we have on in virtual 3D. And every week we're inviting the community to virtually walk through the exhibitions and find the answers to the clues, the quests that we are giving. So this week's quest is, who said a complete Howard University education must include the imparting of values and principles, inspiration, as well as the skills needed to result in our stars illuminating our world and ultimately changing it for the better. So that's a quote that is found somewhere in the exhibition and the quest is to find out who said that quote.
thank you very much. And that information for everyone who wants to submit, you can go to our website, art.howard.edu, to the 50th Annual Art Faculty Exhibition link and enter your answers. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Professor McSwain. Thank you, Dr. Everett. See you next week. <laughs>